What I'd like to share with you today is a challenging combinatorics puzzle and a surprisingly elegant solution to that puzzle that takes advantage of the unique properties of complex numbers. The only things you need to know for this video are the geometric interpretation of complex numbers as points in a two-dimensional plane, addition and multiplication of complex numbers, and Euler's formula. For those of you who need a refresher, a complex number is a number that has a real part and an imaginary part. We can visualize such numbers as living in the two-dimensional plane, where if you draw an arrow from the origin to the complex number, the horizontal distance of the arrow is the real part of the complex number, and the vertical distance is the imaginary part. If you have two complex numbers, w and z, adding them together can be thought of as taking the arrow representing z and moving it such that its tail is at w. Multiplying them can be thought of as rotating z by the angle w makes with the real axis, and then multiplying their magnitudes together. Euler's formula states that taking e to the power of some imaginary number, theta times i, gives a complex number with magnitude 1 whose angle with the real axis is theta. This means we can think of rotating a complex number by an angle theta as simply multiplying that number by e to the power of theta times i. Now here's the puzzle. Consider a rectangle that can be broken into smaller rectangles, such that each small rectangle has at least one side of integer length. Prove that the big rectangle must also have at least one side of integer length. For example, the following rectangle can be broken into smaller rectangles, such that each small rectangle has at least one side of integer length. I claim that either the height of the big rectangle or its width is an integer. In this case, the width of the rectangle is 4. This really is not obvious at all, and it's super non-obvious how you could prove this. I strongly recommend you take out a piece of paper and try to find a counterexample. It will make the solution to this puzzle all the more beautiful. At the heart of our solution is a function that takes in a rectangle as input and spits out a complex number as an output. This function will allow us to transform our puzzle into a simpler puzzle. But before we can talk about this function, we need the following definition. Consider a point on a coordinate grid. Let h be the complex number e to the power 2 pi i times the quantity x plus y, where x and y are the coordinates of the point. Geometrically, this complex number looks like an arrow from the origin to a point on the unit circle such that the length of this arc is 2 pi times the quantity x plus y. Since we know that the circumference of the circle is 2 pi, another way to think of this is that the output of our function is x plus y of the way around the circle. For instance, if x plus y is a whole number, then we end up back at the point 1. If x plus y were equal to a quarter, then we would end up a quarter of the way around the circle, which is the point i, and so on. We'll call the value of this function at some point p the h value of the point p. For example, the h value of the point 0 0.2, 0 0.1 is negative 0 0.3 plus 0.9i, and its geometric interpretation is that it's a point on the unit circle such that the length of this arc is 0 0.6 times pi. If you compute x plus y of our original point, you get 0 0.3. So you can also think of the output point as being the complex number that is 3 tenths of the way around the unit circle. We are now ready to explore the heart of our solution. We'll define the function f that takes in a rectangle as input and returns the average h value over every point on the rectangle as output. We'll call the value of the function for some rectangle the f value of the rectangle. So for example, the f value for this rectangle works out to be 3.1 plus 2i. We can compute the f value for any rectangle of any size anywhere in the complex plane. But hold on a second. What does it even mean to take the average over a shape? And how would you calculate it? We want to be able to think about this average in a way that will allow us to use the intuition we already have for discrete averages. So let's think about this in terms of taking an average over finitely many points. Consider a rectangle and some evenly spaced points in the rectangle. Each point has some h value, 
Taking the average H value over these points will give us an approximation for the F value of the rectangle. If we want to make this approximation better, we can simply take the average over more points. The more points we use, the better the approximation. We might think of the F function as the average H value over infinitely many evenly spaced points. Some of you might correctly recognize that this sounds a lot like an integral. We will come back to this relationship at the end of the video. Given the puzzle we are trying to solve, it's natural to look at the F value for some rectangles with an integer side length and try to find a pattern. For a rectangle with a width of 4 and a height of 1.5, the F value turns out to be 0. For a rectangle with a width of square root of 2 and a height of 2, the F value is again 0. We might conjecture that every rectangle with at least one integer side length has an F value of 0. This fact is going to be very useful, but before we use it, we want to know if it's true for all rectangles and not just the ones we tested. How can we prove this conjecture? We want to start by building some understanding of the function for rectangles with at least one side of integer length. It might be beneficial to think about the simplest case. One way to simplify things is to imagine a rectangle that has width 1 and a really tiny height. Intuitively, we just need to think about the average h value across this thin strip. Let's call the number of points n and set it to be a very large number. Because the points are evenly spaced, they must be a distance of 1 over n from each other. We want to find the average h value of these points. In order to do so, let's look at the geometric interpretation of these function values. The first point gets mapped to some point on the unit circle. The next point gets mapped to another point on the circle that's one nth of the way around the circle relative to the first point. The next point maps to a point one nth of the way around the circle relative to the second point, and so on. Now remember that the length of the entire strip is one, so when we map all the points using our h function, we end up with n points equally spaced around the unit circle. What is the average value of these complex numbers? The answer is clearly zero, since these are symmetric about the origin. So the average h value along a thin strip of unit length is zero. Recall that we're referring to that averaging function as f. Therefore, f applied to a unit length, very thin strip is zero. Of course, the same proof applies to a vertical strip. This proof also applies to any integer length strip, since for any integer length, the points will make a whole number of turns around the unit circle, and their average will still be zero. Now let's suppose that we have a rectangle where either the height or the width is an integer, but we no longer require it to be really thin in the other direction. We can create a dense grid of points inside the rectangle, and once again compute the average h value. If the width is an integer, then we know that the average h value along each row is zero. This tells us that when we average over all the rows, we still get zero. If instead the height is an integer, then we know that the average h value along each column is zero. So again, we know that the average for the whole rectangle is still zero. And this proves that any rectangle with either integer height or integer width has an f value of zero. A natural question to ask is, does the other direction hold? That is, if the f value of a rectangle is zero, is it necessarily true that the rectangle has at least one side of integer length? So let's assume f is zero. Consider the average h value across a thin strip along the bottom of the rectangle with height delta y. You can think of this as being the average h value over many, many points along the strip. This average is the f value of the thin strip. Let's call it z1. Now let's look at the strip just above that one. Let's call the average h value of this strip z2. We want to find a connection between z1 and z2. So let's look at some points on the first strip with coordinates x, y. Its h value is e to the 2 pi i times the quantity x plus y. Now let's look at the corresponding point on the second strip. Its coordinates are x comma y plus delta y, and so its h value is e to the 2 pi i times the quantity x plus y plus delta y, which we can expand out this way. So we get the same h value as in the first strip, except that we have to multiply it by this constant term 
e to the 2 pi i delta y. What is this number? Well, it's just a complex number on the unit circle whose angle relative to the x-axis is 2 pi delta y. When you multiply this by another complex number w, this has the effect of leaving the magnitude of w the same while rotating w by an angle of 2 pi delta y. In other words, every time we calculate h for one of these points for the second strip, we get the same h value that we did for the point below, except that it's rotated by the small constant angle of 2 pi delta y. This property is what makes the h function so useful for us. So when we take the average h value over the entire second strip, we get the same f value as the strip below, except that it's been rotated by this small angle of 2 pi times delta y. What about the strip just above that? The exact same reasoning applies. We get the same f value just rotated by another 2 pi delta y, and so on. To summarize, the f value of the bottom strip is some complex number z1. The f value of the strip that is delta y units above that is the same complex number, except that it has been rotated delta y fraction of a full circle. The f value of the strip above that one is that same complex number rotated another delta y of the way around, and so on. This continues all the way up to the top of our rectangle. So now if we plot the average h value for each horizontal strip, we just get a bunch of points evenly spaced out around the circle in the complex plane. Now we assumed that f applied to the whole rectangle is zero. That means that the average value of these points we've plotted must be zero. So those evenly spaced out points must make a full rotation or multiple full rotations around the circle in order to average out to zero. Remember that each new z is rotated delta y of the way around the circle so that the total rotation is the number of strips required to fill the rectangle times delta y. Now we said that the total number of rotations must be an integer, and so we conclude that the number of strips times delta y is an integer. Finally, the number of strips times delta y is of course the height of the rectangle, and so this proves that the height is an integer. Now there is a problem with this proof. Do you see what it is? The problem is the assumption that since the average of these z values is zero, they must make a full rotation around the circle. Now this is generally true, but there is another case that we didn't consider. If every z value is zero, then their average would still be zero, but the height of the rectangle doesn't have to be an integer. But in that case, the width would be an integer. Proving this uses very similar ideas to the ones we just used, so we'll leave that proof to the viewers. What is our conclusion from all this? If the f value of a rectangle is zero, then either the width or the height or both must be integers. Combining these two directions, we get a very powerful equivalence. The f value of a rectangle is zero if and only if the rectangle has at least one side of integer length. With this equivalence, we can reframe the puzzle around the f function. Given a rectangle that can be broken into smaller rectangles, such that the f value of every small rectangle is zero, prove that the f value of the big rectangle is zero. In order to prove this, we need to ask ourselves, given that the f value for every small rectangle is zero, what could the f value for the whole rectangle possibly be? Well, it's just the average over the f values for each smaller rectangle. Well, it's actually a weighted average, but it doesn't matter since we're just averaging together a bunch of zeros. This tells us that the f value for the whole rectangle is zero. And from our equivalence, we conclude that the whole rectangle has at least one integer length side. That's the solution to our puzzle. Some of you may have noticed that the f function is an example of an integral. In fact, our whole solution could have been written with just a few lines of calculus. The calculus proof would be much shorter because although the two proofs are mathematically identical, they are written in two completely different languages the language of symbols, and the language of ideas. Thinking in terms of symbols tends to make finding solutions, generalizing them, and communicating them easier. So why don't we use the more powerful and efficient language? Because thinking in terms of ideas is what gives math its beauty and gives us an intuitive understanding of it. Too often, students are only taught with the language of symbols, which leads to the misconception that math is a boring, uncreative, and technical field when in fact it is actually one of the most beautiful, exciting, and intriguing fields of study. For example, this differential equation looks boring and off-putting, 
But if you translate it to the language of ideas, you get the much, much more elegant double pendulum. Well, that concludes the presentation. We do read all the comments, so feel free to leave a question, a stinging criticism, or another example of a puzzle with a surprisingly elegant solution. Thanks for watching, and I hope this video made you appreciate the beauty of mathematics just a little bit more.